All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Liz Torres Melendez, and I'm the assistant site manager at the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum. I'm excited to be here tonight for our lecture, Meet the Browns, Heroes and Consequences of Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and before I introduce our lecture tonight, I wanna talk a little bit about the Palmer Memorial Institute, tell you why I wanted to have this conversation in the first place. So for those of you who don't know, the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum is on the grounds of the former Palmer Memorial Institute, which was founded in 1902 by Dr. Brown, who at that time was a young Black teacher looking to provide access to education to a rural, predominantly Black community. In the late 1920s and through the 1930s, Palmer grew from being a mostly K through 12 agricultural and teacher training school into a social finishing and college preparatory school. By 1948, Palmer was known internationally as the premier social finishing and college preparatory school for the black middle class. And that was a title given to the school by Ebony Magazine. An alumni study was done in the late 1960s and they found that 90% of Palmer graduates went on to get a bachelor's degree and 60% of those students went further to receive a master's or a PhD. Palmer closed in 1971 for a number of reasons. And one of those reasons was a culture shift. As a private school without a consistent endowment, Palmer always relied on donor funding to be able to grow and continue. Uh, student tuition was enough to cover the basic expenses and uh, most salaries, but things like building maintenance, growth, extracurricular activities relied on the institution raising funds annually. When Brown versus Board, uh, when the Brown versus Board decision was issued in 1954, the president of Palmer at the time was a woman named Wilhelmina Crossan, and she understood what the um, what the decision would mean for a school like Palmer. She wanted to create a plan to proactively integrate Palmer slowly and intentionally to ensure that the school would keep their commitment to Black students and their families while being able to exist in a new reality, right? Her proposals were never implemented and Ms. Crossan retired in 1966. As school desegregation became the law, a school exclusively for black students uh, was not only <laughs> included in these desegregation laws, but also became very politically unpopular. Unable to articulate why a black school like Palmer was still important and unwilling to integrate, the Board of Trustees failed to court and retain donors throughout the late 1960s. By 1971, when a fire took out the Central Academic Building, Palmer was in a really tough spot financially. And after a closed door private Board of Trustees meeting, they decided to um, close the school's doors rather than try to rebuild and adapt. Now, a lack of nuance in the conversation about education and integration created a difficult environment for Black schools, Black educators, and Black students. Today, I hope we're able to approach this conversation with nuance and this political moment with nuance and care and allow ourselves and allow ourselves to honestly contemplate and consider the legacies of Brown versus Board of Education and school integration. Um, and so without further ado, I will introduce our guest lecturer today. Dr. Stephen D. Hancock is the Fry Distinguished Professor of Urban Teacher Education and the Director of the Center of Excellence for Educational Equity Research in the College of Education at North Carolina A&T State University. He received his bachelor's in English with a minor in Latin and a master's in elementary education from Virginia Commonwealth University and a PhD in curriculum and instruction from The Ohio State University. He is the director of the International Conference on Urban Education, which is the only conference in the world that focuses solely on the successes and challenges in the urban context. As an instructor, he teaches graduate and undergraduate level courses and has also served as an international visiting lecturer in Ireland, England, Germany, and Poland. Recently, Dr. Hancock has joined the Pan-African Leadership Institute Instructor Corps 
He also serves on the Social Justice Action Committee at AERA on several community organizations and is a member of other professional associations. As a researcher, Dr. Hancock's interests include race, identity, and well-being as it relates to access and social justice, and he specializes in autoethnographic and ethnographic methodologies. He's published in top journals and has co-edited three books. After Dr. Hancock's lecture, we'll take questions from the audience, so feel free to drop things in the chat or use the Q&A feature here on Zoom. And now, Dr. Hancock, I will turn it over to you. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Um, as you know, I'm Dr. Hancock, and I greet you on this historic eve um, that will mark 70 years since the landmark civil rights um, decision, Brown versus the Board of Education. Now, I must say that um, there was much deep thought and hesitation in doing this type of talk in my field, in my world. Doing a Brown lecture is top notch um, information. And though I am not a historian, but I love our history, um, I heavily rely on uh, James Anderson's work, as well as Leslie Fenwick and Michelle Alexander, just to name a few but as well as the Racial Justice Initiative and the Legal Defense Fund's websites. The reason I named those because I really want you to, to go there and find this work to, to do more than what we've been doing um, in the educational spaces. Nonetheless, I am sure that each of us has a story of how Brown um, or how the Brown decision has impacted and transformed our lives as well as um, the American culture in our space. And each of our stories are powerful, they're meaningful, and influential in how we live today. And so I encourage you to reflect and share your story with others so that it will live as a legacy of our triumph and of our foreparents' determination. Now, while the Brown Lecture has two sides, uh, we still must begin to push this knowledge and share it. Um, so that everyone can have a broader sense of what it meant and what it still means. So as we journey through this presentation, I want to start with a quote that is the legacy of my mother. And the quote, it, is, it forms my life's perspective, and it is weaved throughout this talk. It simply states that a single bracelet doesn't jingle, which is a Congolese proverb. And it often means or can mean that one person's voice of freedom cannot move like the voices of many people. And so when we are thinking of that ideology, this one bracelet cannot jingle. We want to be get to think about how Brown really worked. And oftentimes we think about, as you look at the picture, the three men on the bottom, in the middle, of course, um, the incomparable Thurgood Marshall. And at the top, we see um, the famous picture of a mom and a daughter with the newspaper um, headlines. And this is often the image we see. But remember, a single bracelet doesn't jingle. And while the three men at the bottom were the, the brain child and the brilliance of the law, there were so many different components that made this work. And tonight, I want to take you through a journey to look at those um, components. And so in this presentation, we are gonna delve into the stories and events and people less known and explored to see the impact and the connectedness of small acts that spark this large movement. The title of the talk is Meet the Browns, um, Heroes and Consequences of Brown versus the Board of Education. And as you understand, Meet the Browns is, is a play on the show that I really ever watched, but um, I wanted you to begin to meet others in this fight, others that pushed this legislation across, others that swelled up the ground room. And so it is my intention to share a fresh perspective on those who risk their lives and livelihoods to bring this case to trial and those who struggle to bring the law into reality. So as we know, nothing happens in isolation. However, if we often look at Brown versus the Boy as one lone act in a sea of, it, of historical events. But we know that a single bracelet doesn't jingle if we take that ideology. Um, then we understand that 
The Brown Law is seen is often seen as a catalyst for change, but it really is the result of many catalysts that started in kitchens, classrooms, fields, churches, and in the hearts, minds, and souls of those fighting for freedom as a collective sounding bracelet. So as we consider the voices of the Brown case, we should also consider who were the real heroes of this epic event. And that's what I really want to begin to think about, or you to think about who were the real heroes. And so I want you to just take a couple of seconds to think, who do you believe are the real heroes? We have pictures of, of course, Derek Marsha and the other um, lawyers, but who were the real heroes if it weren't, if it wasn't them? So what I want to start off with is this confluence of events that created a groundswell that we know now as the Brown, um, Brown versus the Board of Education case. I will focus on the time frame from 1942 to 1964. And in this 22 year span, we saw the crumbling of Jim Crow coupled with the unapologetic and vehement resurgence of white supremacy, both in state legislations and in the living rooms of white people and the unyielding strength of people determined to be free of blatant racism. So we saw this confluence and that's very important. These three big waves were happening. Jim Crow crumbling at a federal level, white supremacy rising at a, uh, um, rising and resurrecting at a state and home level, and then the unyielding strength of a people fighting for freedom, all converging and all confluing on one space. And so the, the 1940s set the groundwork that started the crumbling of racist laws in federal government. The rulings, executive orders, and lawsuits in the 1940s weakened Jim Crow at the federal level, while personal stories of bravery, frustration, and pain were being played out in homes of Black families who fought racism on the local and personal level. In university laboratories, similar work on psychology of Black children was being conducted, and landmark articles were being published to dismantle ideas of Black inferiority. While brilliant lawyers were gathering all this information to create an unbeatable argument against separate but equal racism. And then the unintended consequences of Brown that provided no date to end Jim Crow practice and put black children in the path of hate filled racist mobs. And yet, despite the challenges and consequences, the heroes of this movement continue to press forward. So let's begin to look at the crumbling of Jim Crow in federal spaces. First, let's start with 1942. In 1942, we had President Roosevelt signing an executive order 8802, banning discriminatory employment practices by federal agencies and all unions and companies engage in war-related work. You have to be very clear on that, engage in war-related work. Um, and so it was a very specific order, right? So it didn't touch other types of, of work, but it was federal work that dealt with war. The order was um, also established the Fair Employment Practice Commission to enforce the new policy. But this order was signed in response to Black leaders threatening, ready, to march on Washington in 1941. So the first march on Washington was being planned 20 years prior to the, the original, or oh, to the one we know in 1963. But President Roosevelt signed the executive order, which then began to dismantle this federal Jim Crow spaces. So now it is becoming integrated in, in federal spaces. Second, you have 1944. 1944, um, Smith versus Allwright. In this, Thurgood Marshall rose in front of the United States Supreme Court to argue that Texas's democratic primary system allowed whites to structurally dominate the politics of the one party South. Specifically, the case presented the question of whether the Texas Democratic Party policy of prohibiting Blacks from voting in primary elections violated the 14th and 15th Amendments. So here you have 
Thurgood Marshall 10 years before the Brown versus the Board of Education, arguing before the same pro the Supreme Court with Smith versus Allwright. Then the Supreme Court decided that the United States is a constitutional democracy. Its organic law grants to all citizens a right to participate in the choice of elected officials without restriction by any state because of race. This grant to the people of the, op the people, the opportunity for choice is not to be nullified by a state through casting its electoral process. In so ruling, Smith overruled a unanimous nine-year-old decision in Grovey versus Townsend that held that the Texas Democratic Party's race restriction on voting in primaries was constitutional. Once again, the breaking down of this federal um, Jim Crow space. Okay, now we haven't touched local or state, but in the federal spaces, we begin to break down. And I want you to continue to think, who are the real heroes? Then in 1946, Morgan versus Virginia. This was decided on June 3rd in 1946. The U.S. Supreme Court struck down a Virginia law requiring racial segregation on commercial interstate buses as a violation to the Commerce Clause of the United States. The appealing Irene Morgan, an African-American woman, was riding a Greyhound bus from Hayes Store in Gloucester County to Baltimore, Maryland in 1944 when she was arrested and convicted of in Saluda for refusing to give up her seat to a white person. Once again, this is 10 years before Rosa Parks. So you want to begin to think about these laws, that this movement was already in process. So Miss Morgan was one of the first women um, to be arrested for not giving up her seat. Then the NAACP came in and filed appeals on her behalf. And after the Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals ruled against Morgan in 1945, the U.S. Supreme Court heard the arguments and the case came um, near the end of a string of decisions dating back to 1878 in which various courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court, had found that the Commerce Clause did not support state laws that regulated commercial interstate passenger travel. Morgan v. Virginia was not a typical civil rights case in that it did not comment on the state's rights to segregate white people from black people. Still, Morgan's refusal to give up her seat foreshadowed Rosa Parks' more famous action a decade later and marked an early and important victory in the civil rights movement. So here you have the breaking down, the continued breaking down of federal Jim Crow. And then finally, in 1948, President Harry S. Truman signed Executive Order 9981, banning segregation in the armed forces. Of course, this is after World War II, because in 1940, African Americans made up almost 10% of the total U.S. population at 12.6 million, and out of a total of 131. During World War II, the Army had become the nation's largest minority employer. Of the 2.5 million African-American males who registered for the draft through the summer of 1945, more than 1 million were inducted into the armed forces. And so that large number, uh, once again, pushed uh, President Truman to actually sign this order. These efforts began to clear, once again, clearly dismantle Jim Crow on the federal level, but it lacked real influence on the state <clears throat> level and particularly the state level in the South. So as we move into, sorry, um, in deeper into the Jim Crow space. Now we're going into the, the era of 1949 to 1954. So here um, you have the Dahl study. And this Dahl study was extremely important to Brown. Now, the clocks will say that they didn't start off, this was not meant for what it was used for, but it was. <clears throat> But before we go into this, I want to just give you a story on the Clarks. So although Dr. Clark is most the most famous for the doll test, his personal achievements are equally as prestigious 
He was the first African-American to earn a PhD in psychology at Columbia, to hold a permanent professorship in the City College of New York, and to join the New York State Board of Regents. He also served as president of the American Psychological Association. His wife, Mamie Clark, was the first African-American woman and the second African-American after her husband to receive a doctorate at Columbia. And in the 1940s, the psychologists Kenneth and Mamie Clark designed and conducted a series of experiments known colloquially as the Dawn Studies to study the psychological effects of segregation on African-American children. Now, Dr. Clark, or Dr. Clark, used four dolls, identical except for color, to test children's racial perceptions. Their subjects, children between the ages of three to seven, were asked to identify both the race of the dolls and which color doll they preferred. A majority of the children preferred the white doll and assigned positive attributes to it. The clocks concluded that prejudice, discrimination, and segregation created a feeling of inferiority among African-American children and damaged their self-esteem. <clears throat> this doll study then um, was only one part of the testimony that the Browns, that Dr. Clark gave in the Brown versus the Board of Education. It did not constitute the largest portion of his analysis and, and expert report, because in that excerpt, in that report, he also gave us the reality that um, segregation also is harmful for white children, but it was never heard in the court. His conclusions during his testimony were based on a comprehensive analysis of the most cutting edge psychology, um, psychological scholarship of the period. So these were two giants in this, um, in the Brown versus Board, as well as in psychology, especially this cutting edge psychology on black children, as well as on race. So their work as professors, as researchers, impacted and influenced what was happening on a national stage, <clears throat> particularly in Brown versus the Board of Education. And so what they did was they looked to at this idea of how race, color, and social status influence self-esteem and found that it is really, really important that Black children, as well as white children, um, work together, learn together, so they do not develop inferiority complexes. But once again, I will ask you, who is the real hero? So, so far, we know about the dream team of the defense, the Legal Defense Fund. We also have talked a little bit about pre the presidents who signed executive orders. We talked about um, George, I mean, um, Thurgood Marshall, as he, uh, you know, was on earlier cases. And now we're introduced to the Clarks, a husband and wife dynamic duo um, psychologist who created a study that is still replicated today, okay? And still um, has very similar results as it did in the 1940s. So next, I want to take you to some of the real heroes. And I want you to take a pause, a, a break, and just look at the pictures that you see here. And I won't be able to talk about each of them, um, but I will name them because it's very important that we name um, our heroes. And in this case, our sheroes. Um, I believe the real heroes of the Brown versus the Board of Education were young Black women. Now, while there were some black young Black males or men um, part of this case, the majority, the vast majority, were Black girls moving and walking into the mobs of anger in the isolation of cafeterias and schools. These were the brave soldiers. These were the heroes of the Brown versus the Board of Education. And while I know and truly believe in the brilliance of Thurgood Marshall and that team, they would not have been there without these girls going before um, the, the cases or creating the cases. And we'll talk about those cases in just a few seconds. First, I wanna talk about two. And these two come from um, Delaware. First, you see Linda Brown of Kansas, Catherine Copper of Kansas, Shirley Bula, Delaware, Ethel Bula, 
I mean, El Ethel Be Belton of Delaware, Barbara Johns of Virginia, Barbara Jennings of Washington, D.C., and Joy Cabrera Speaks of Virginia. It's very important that we honor our, um, our leaders and we say uh, their name. But I'll start with Ethel Belton and listen to her story, right? So Ethel was born with a heart condition. But because she was Black, she had no choice but to travel 20 miles to Howard High School, 20 miles away from her home one way, which was the only public school in the state of Delaware that admitted Black students. Her mother was concerned about Ethel's health um, and, the, and how the trip would treat it. And so she petitioned the school board over and over again to allow her daughter to attend Clay, Claymont High School, which was reserved for only white children, but which was very close to her home. And each time her request was denied. Despite Ethel's status as a young girl with a severe medical condition, Ethel was treated as unworthy of any protection simply because she was black. So fed up, her mother joined as the lead plaintiff with black parents bringing a lawsuit, Belton versus Gephardt, in one of the five cases that eventually became Brown versus the Board of Education. Today, Ethel's story remains largely unknown, as does the identity of many black girls who were vastly overrepresented as plaintiffs in the courts and as the leaders behind school desegregation and the organizing efforts. In Prince Edward County, Virginia, for example, 16-year-old Barbara Johns, in defiance of her principal, led a walkout of her fellow students at Moton High School, her segregated high school, to protest the inferior facilities and subpar educational materials given to Black students, an act that was a catalyst behind the Davis versus Prince Edward County School Board, another um, companion case in the Brown. Indeed, the underlying cases that originated in Kansas and other countries and other states provided the name that most people don't know, but it con connected and collected to provide the name Brown versus the Board of Education of Tobacco. All but one of the plaintiffs were women, only one male um, in that space. And so we got to understand the real heroes. The real heroes are Black women, and we need to begin to promote and push them. Another story is um, Shirley Beulah. So Shirley Beulah, um, her story of hardship started as a mixed race child with a biological mother of Asian descent and a father of African American descent. Her mother made the difficult decision not to raise her. And she simply abandoned her child in a public space a few blocks from the train station in Wilmington, Delaware. When the story appeared on a local paper, about the abandoned infant, Sarah and Fred Beulah read the newspaper and felt compelled to give this infant a home. It was fate. Shirley Beulah was born in 1945. The exact date and month is unknown. But what is known is that Fred and Sarah adopted her and named her Shirley Barbara. With the addition of Shirley, the couple now had nine children in the household. Shirley's adopted mother wanted the best for her children and all she ever said to them was, and others was, I want you to have your due. Her eight siblings welcomed the new infant, helped raise her, and she quickly became the center of attention. And once she reached high school, I mean, elementary school age, concerned about the circumstances surrounding education for African-American students in Delaware grew. Though the other Beulah children were well past elementary school age, and had been educated in the same segregated school that Shirley was attending, her parents did not want her to go there anymore. So as the story goes, a school bus was, was transporting white elementary students past their home every day, yet she was not able to get on that bus and go. And her mother um, was angered and frustrated that her youngest child was not able to attend classes at the large brick building with a playground and library. And so Ms. Bueller became a plaintiff in the case against Gephardt, against the Gephardt group in Delaware. And the case was eventually paired with the Belton case and later the Brown versus the Board of Education. 
And so you see these, this, each of these young women have a, has a story that is very similar. And we, we must begin to understand that while we're looking at Thurgood Marshall and the dream team, which they give them their rights and their due, these young girls were the girls that brought this case to bear. These were the girls that experienced this space in their local home, experienced the racism, experienced the segregation, experienced it. These girls and their parents pushed this case um, into national prominence. So what I want you to look at now is that the Brown case is made of five different um, lawsuits. And the lawsuits were the Belton versus Gephardt and Beulah versus Gephardt, Delaware State, Oliver Brown et al. versus the Board of Education, Topeka. That's the one that we um, we have put in front, or that, that was the one that led. Bridges et al. versus Elliott, U.S. District Court, Eastern Division, Charleston, South Carolina. Bowling versus Sharp, Washington, D.C. And Davis, Davis um, versus County School Board of Prince Edward County, Richmond, Virginia. So what I want you to do is just as I'm as I'm talking to you now, look at names and see if you recognize any. I'm going to tell you um, a truth. As I went through this um, in my research, I saw some names that I thought were familiar, um, and so I called my sister-in-law and asked, is this her family? Or does she recognize any names? And she says she believes that those, the names that I gave her were names of her distant um, relatives. So you may find um, names on here that you, you didn't know. And as I was reading stories, many families didn't share that they were part of this. Um, and so I want you to begin to think about these names. And if you don't know them, just remember that these are the true heroes. These are the people who had to live through this. And so in this milestone decision, the Supreme Court ruled that separating children in public schools on the basis of race was unconstitutional. It signaled the end of legalized racial segregation in the schools of the United States, overruling separate but equal principle that was set forth in, 19, in 1896 by Plessy versus Ferguson. Now this federal act moves into state and local spaces for the first time. As so we remember in the 40s, it was all on the federal level. Now in 1954, on May 17th, this now moved into state spaces and into living rooms, kitchens, and the homes of people in the North and the South. So on, that, on May 17th, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren delivered the unanimous ruling in the landmark civil rights case Brown v. Board. State-sanctioned segregation of public schools was a violation of the 14th Amendment and was therefore unconstitutional. The historic decision marked the end of separate but equal that was set 60 years prior. Arguments were to be heard during the next term to determine just how the ruling would be imposed. So over one year later, on May 31st, 1955, Warren read the court's unanimous decision, now referred to as Brown 2. So Brown 1 stated that it was unconstitutional. Brown 2 now reads the unanimous decision, instructing that states begin the segregating plans with all deliberate speed. Once again, not really saying when, but with all deliberate speed. And despite the two unanimous decisions and, and careful, if vague, wording, there was considerable resistance to the Supreme Court's ruling in Brown versus the Board of Education. In addition to the obvious disapproving segregationists, were some constitutional scholars who felt the decision went against legal tradition by relying only on um, social scientists rather than, rather than on law. And then there are the supporters of just judicial restraint believe that the court overstepped its constitutional powers by essentially writing new law. And these were the fights that was happening 
Um, but because of the dream team, none of them were able to get off ground and the law set as we began to realize it. Now, here it is, 1954 and 1955. But there was 10 years before anything happened in the South. So here are some of the consequences. As you're looking at all of these mothers and daughters and sons and fathers who put their names, their lives, and their livelihoods on the line to fight segregation, the unintended consequences became real. And so when the U.S. Supreme Court deemed segregation, segregated schools unconstitutional in 1954 and came back in 1955 and with the proposal to move with all deliberate speed, the decision became a vague symbol of racial progress and the ruling became or came with the tragic loss of black schools that were closed down by the state and many state and private schools were closed due to enrollment, due to lack of funds, and due to lack of support. In addition, the dismissal of tens of thousands of black teachers and principals as white school staff poured into previously all black schools and were promoted into leadership roles over their black colleagues began to create what we now see today, the, the removal of the, the decimation of the black teaching population, the destruction of the black educational leadership and the pouring in of what we now have um, in a book that, um, one of the books that I edited called White Women's Work. In this space, schools have become white women's work this is an unintentional consequence of the Brown versus Board. The fallout from the loss of generations of, teach of Black educators continues today because fewer than one in 10 teachers in the U.S. public schools are Black, according to the Pew Research Center. And while the share of Black teachers and those from other marginalized backgrounds has increased in recent decades, their proportion isn't keeping up with the nation's rapidly diversifying population of school-aged children and the continued stream of white women into education, and specifically elementary education. In her recently published book, Jim Crow's Pink Slip, The Untold Story of Black Principal and Teacher Leadership, Leslie Fenwick details how the Supreme Court decision affected Black educators and what the ramifications are today. It is a brilliant read if you haven't picked it up. Fenwick, an education professor at Howard University and the former dean who served as the dean of the department for over a decade, spoke to Capitol B about the inspiration behind her book and how it can help people understand the policy issues that persist in education. So when we think about this work, um, Leslie Fenwick has, or Dr. Fenwick has um, provided a wonderful um, treatise on the consequences of Brown, the unintended consequences, and, and what it has done to the Black teaching and Black leadership population in education. The final or, or the last unintended consequence is the miseducation of Black children. And this has created what is termed curriculum trauma. Now, curriculum trauma is caused by the abusive knowledge that Black children receive as a result of whitewashed textbooks and curriculum content. This whitewashed textbook and curriculum content simply whitewashes Black experiences and Black trauma and Black pain in um, to create a space for white superiority and white ease. And so you can think of it like this. Curriculum trauma is the overrepresentation of positive things for whites or positive knowledge for whites and the overrepresentation of negative or, or for African-Americans or the overrepresentation of omitting things for African-Americans 
and the overrepresentation of emitting negative for whites. And in this, it creates, it goes right back to the Dahl study. The outcome of, of curriculum trauma is internalized superiority for whites. It is contrarily internalized inferiority for African-Americans. Curriculum trauma is doing the same thing um, or having the same results as the, the doll study. And what we want to begin to think about is how do we change this space? What can we do um, to change these unintended consequences? How can we move forward um, to create a space where our children are just as strong and just as um, feel just as smart and, and, and are just as nurtured as all other students in our public schools. And so I would say that our mission today is to encourage the Black community to promote teaching as a means to promote healthy culture, brilliant children, and a strong, cohesive future. As an elementary school teacher and now a teacher of teachers, it is my hope and my dream to continue to nurture education in our homes, to continue to tell families to, to promote teaching, um, to continue to push more African-American um, men and women into the teaching force. And we will fight like the Greensboro Four and champion the words of Ella Baker. as she says, "Who we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We cannot rest even though the unintended consequences of Brown are alive today, so are the intended consequences. So are the, 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 the resources that we now have. And so I would say, let's pick up those resources. Let's begin to pick up um, um, the, the positive consequences and push our students into education. It is the only way that we're going to be able to move beyond um, where we are. It's the only way we can begin to brown up the, the education um, arena. I honestly believe, as I close, that teaching is the salt of citizenship. Teachers are the salt of citizenship. We are the ones who flavor the culture. And if our students are taught in a space where they are felt made whole, in a space where they are comforted, in a space where their intelligence and their culture is supported, they will be, and we will be, a better country. And so I, I thank you with that, and I'll open it up to questions. That's wonderful. That last quote, I just know, having read Dr. Brown's own words and spent a lot of time with her philosophies on education, that teaching is the salt of citizenship, that is in line exactly with so much of what Dr. Brown wrote about education and the role and the responsibility of teachers. So thank you so much for that. Um, for our participants, folks, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or put them in the Q&A feature. Um, we uh, don't allow for the the speaking or your own microphone, so you will have to type it out if you want to to ask a question today. Um, and I do have some prepared questions as well. So I'll, I'll start with my own selfishly, um, but if anybody has any, please feel free to drop them in the chat and I will keep an eye on that. Um, but my first question, as I was um, kind of preparing for this this week and, and kind of delving into the world of Brown and just getting in that, in that headspace, I saw a story from WUNC on Monday um, by Liz Schlemmer, um, and she writes about a study out of NC State that found that North Carolina public schools are becoming more and more racially segregated. Um, and particularly that the trend and the popularity of charter schools kind of bears this out. So North Carolina, the quote is um, North Carolina in North Carolina, charter schools had the largest share of schools where students of color make up at least 99 percent of the student body. What do you 
kind of thinking about the the unintended consequences of Brown that you talked about and the white backlash and the resurgence of white supremacy and all of the systems. Um, and the the do you feel like what do you think this this resurgence of school segregation and the rise of charter schools? Um, do you think that speaks to that? Do you think these things are related or what do you think that this says, this slow resegregation kind of says about that? Yeah, that's that's a very good question and a, a very good observation. So as we think about um, human beings uh, and we think about how we, we navigate our own lives and our own spaces, we also have to think about the legacy of what we've been taught and so I often say that, you know, racism and love and and comfort and peace, they don't just disappear. If it's in your family, um, if you don't face it, you're not going to fix it. And it then gets passed down. And so what is happening in our society now is that particularly Black families and, and Black um, children have realized that schools are not working. Right, we've 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 been knowing that since the um, early '70s that these integrated schools are not working. Right, um, then charter schools pops up, pop up, and black communities believe that if they can get a charter school and have their own power in that space, then they can better educate their children. What is happening, unfortunately, is that they're finding out that charter schools are really public schools, and they can't do what all it that they exactly want to do. Plus the teaching population may then very mirror what is at the normal public schools. On the other hand, um, in the white community with more wealth and more access, the charter schools have become almost like private schools, right? And they are also exclusively white. Um, and so that charter school movement, as we think about the consequences of Brown is, is an elongated consequence of Brown. Um, now people are, are pushing to get back into these spaces or it sounds like or feels like um, one group is trying to educate um, the group the best they can. The other group um, is possibly feeling that they want, you know, not to be in the, in the schools with others um, of people of color. And so um, once again, it is the same thing. It's it's almost like the 1970s white flight when when the private school um when private schools rose as a result of brown when the proliferation of private schools of private church schools and that is what's happening and that's the proliferation of um charter schools uh and so and in this space is is both um charter schools for minoritized students and and charter schools for white students and the proliferation is is birthed out of many things, and part of it is this desire to to be exclusive or be segregated. In your research, have you found any models of schools post Brown and post actual desegregation in the process of integration, where there were spaces intentionally interculturally created? Yeah, so Charlotte was the big, um, you know, the big experiment. It, it it did very well in the 70s, um, integrating schools like West Charlotte. Um, it 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 has, you know, um, very good data on how it integrated and the success of that integration. Right, um, you have Charlotte leaders who who talk about the wonderful space that. That um, that was happening here in Charlotte as they were doing the integration. So there are those spaces, and then you do. You, I'm sure you have pocket schools. In my research, I haven't really um seen those schools that are doing very well, that are um, you know, nicely integrated. Um, but I know there are schools in the region here in North Carolina that are, that intentionally um integrated the schools so that it was intentionally um, racially integrated. However, with the new political space we're in, um, a lot of those things are now pushed out. 
um, a lot of those those ideas of creating a, a equally in integrated space are now gone to the wayside. And so that is unfortunate. Um, but in the 70s, um, here in Charlotte, and I believe in other spaces, the integration experiment was a success. Awesome. So I saw a question from Marilyn to please repeat the title of the book by Dr. Fenwick. So I just want to say that it's Jim Crow's Pink Slip, and I dropped the link to the book in the chat for anybody who's interested. Um, and any other questions, please feel free to either drop them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, so your research and your work focuses on autoethnography and ethnography. Uh, can you kind of tell us what that is? I mean, you know, as a historian who works at a historic site with folks who are part of the story who are very much still living, I know the value of stories and storytelling, um, but can you just tell us uh, why autoethnography and ethnographic work? So autoethnography is the study of self and context. Um, looking at how self navigates, how you navigate the context that you're in. Um, and it's a very reflective and reflexive type of work um, that we go in and reflect. And so in this, doing this work, um, and I have many stories, I, I, I was going to put them in there and I, yeah, I was thinking maybe the time would run out. But um, these reflexive stories, um, in autoethnography, and as I was doing this research, I was doing reflexive work. Um, and it's more than just a biography, you know, just telling a story about itself. Um, autoethnography requires first a question um, that you are researching, that you are conducting research on. And then it requires all sorts of other methods and processes to create authentic stories, um, not just stories made up or stories remembered, but stories that can be verified. Um, and so, for instance, uh, one of the stories that I was adding that I would have that I will add now to the talk is my experience with integration. Being a a child in the, of the mid seventies, um, right at the crux of the integration space in the state of Virginia, I had to ride a bus forty five minutes away from home to be integrated into a school um, where white students were, and that experience really changed my perspective and my life. It it showed me things that I would never have seen, right? It took me spaces and places that I've never, I would have never gone had integration wasn't it. Was the bus ride a wonderful thing? Of course it wasn't, right? Well, it was a good thing for a nap for Fabio. But other than that, um, that experience um, was is really, really important to my life. And it, it is one of the experiences that pushed me into education. That is an ethnographic story that can be verified. That's an ethnographic story, an autoethnographic story that is real. And so as I opened, I asked you all to begin to think about your, your um, experiences with integration or your experiences with school and connect it to Brown because there is a connection. The law was so... Um, important to American culture, that it continues to reverberate even today. And so as we think about um, autographic research, it's that delve into self to, um, based on a question um, to find an answer to a current reality, right? And so that's eth autoethnography. Uh, of course, ethnography is the study of others, the study of cultures outside of you. Um, so looking at how things work and move. And that is also the research space. In the book, White Woman's Work, I look at the influx of white women after the Brown um, case and how it has been consumed and taken over, particularly in elementary school. And I often ask the question to, to all families, are you okay with your child being educated by um, white women, specifically black families? Um, in this day and age. And if you are, you are. If you're not, then what are you doing to um, mitigate that? Because our schools, as you heard in the in the talk, there's about 1% in each school of Black, of Black teachers. And we have to begin to come back or bring that back. Before Brown, 
90% of our children were educated by Black teachers, right? And so that number has, has flipped. And it is important. The research is continuing to show us that it's very important that we get more um, Black teachers in schools to support not just Black students, but the biggest beneficiary of um, Black teachers, of course, white students, because they become more cultural competent, right? And so that's an ethnographic study that was done with the book, right? That was a more ethnographic space to look at the culture of white women and how they impact teaching. Yeah, thank you. Um, other questions? I'm not seeing any more questions. I could talk to you all day about this kind of history and its modern implications and the work that um, is necessary in the modern day to kind of create equitable um, systems of education. But I think I'll, I'll kind of pitch to you. Can you tell us about the um, the center at a &T that you are the director of, the Center of Excellence for Education Equity Research? What kind of research are you all looking to do or doing um, to kind of get the data behind the change and the things that need to happen in order to create and sustain equity in education? So one of the things we we're big on now is partnering and um, when you reached out, I thought this is going to be an excellent partner to do um, research on equity. And, and we're looking at equity in the state of North Carolina, and we're looking at how we can um, bring equity in, in spaces, of course, where there is inequity. Now, now the, the push against um, DEI in our state um, is, of course, problematic, but we're not looking at diversity and inclusion in the sense you know, in that sense, we're simply looking at equitable access, right? And so our research is all about equity. Um, and when we're thinking about teaching and we're thinking about schools, it's about equity. Is there equitable, um, is there an equitable teaching population in elementary schools? So when you ask that question, we, you, you'll get our answers, right? Um, the, the research shows us that the teaching population is not equitably, equitably distributed. And so one of the things we're going to do in the center is to see how can we um, bring in more um, Black teachers? How can we bring in more teachers of color to um, make sure our students all over the state of North Carolina receive top education, but also um, varying perspectives and diverse perspectives um, in spaces that, uh, you know, uh, that in, in spaces um, like their classroom. And so... That's one of the things that um, the, the center is working on. The center is also working on um, partnerships international, as well as partnerships local and national, um, creating all sorts of research projects, uh, to, once again, to, to um, look at equity. One of the major ones is Black is not a statistic, or being Black is not a statistic, where we're looking at the positive ways North Carolinians or Black North Carolinians move in their day and the successes that they have, because we're, we're going to counterbalance and counter story all the negative responses about test scores and, and all of those things and bring a balance to that so that people can see that while, yes, there are struggles, there are also successes. And so we're going to be focusing equitably on those successes. So we'll balance um you know, the negative news with this more equitable, positive realities of um, Black families and Black success. One of my favorite things that I've recently started doing on field trips, particularly with high school students, is I start now my tours with them by asking them, what do you know about Black education, right? I've told you this was a Black boarding school that started in 1902. When you think of that time period, when you think of Black education, what do you think of? And the the providing the counter narrative is so important because the image that these students have and the understanding that they have, because we're not getting an equitable education, right? There are silences in our curriculum is students think that everything was horrible. And so it's such a beautiful thing to 
I, I then go into, okay, list the HBCUs in North Carolina for me. And you go and you go and you go and you keep going and you keep going and students are like, whoa. And it's like, why would there be that many higher education institutions, right? You need a K through 12 system that feeds into that. And so we know how many schools, how many colleges and universities there are that are historical. <laughs> that means historically there were a lot of lower level educational institutions too, right? And right. so yeah. to see them receiving the counter narrative, getting the history, learning about Palmer and Rosenwald schools and other schools and seeing like, oh, whoa, this is different than what I've been told. It's such a beautiful kind of box to open with them. Um, so I'm really excited to see the work that you all do and, um, you know, to, to continue partnering. Um, and um, if there are no questions from the audience, I think this is a wonderful place to, to call it. Thank you yeah. so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Hancock. Any final words? Yes, I, I just wanted to um, say, I think somebody, there's a number up there. I, um, I wanted to to really hone in on um, the, the, the unintended consequences of curriculum trauma. Um, that is where my research is um, looking at now. And um, I often do this, and once again, I was going to do this, but I I, I should have put it in there, but um, I didn't think I would get finished. Um, one of the things that we talk about in curriculum trauma is that I ask the audience, and of course they can't talk, but of course they can put in um, uh, put it in the chat if they want to. Um, who is the um, developer of um, the pet? Um, a squared plus B squared equals C squared, right? So who started that? I mean, whose name is on that? Okay. So if, if you have that name, just throw it in the audience. I mean, I mean, throw it in the in the um, chat. If you know A squared plus B squared equals C squared, and you can cheat. <laughs> um, you can look it up. So who is the the um? Who, what is it? Who is it named after? Or what is it called? What is that theorem called? Did anybody I'm put it in? The Pythagorean. I'm so yeah. bad at math. It's been forever. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, somebody put it in. Uh, oh no! They just said it was out. So the, the the Pythagorean theorem. So I I want you to take that theorem and um, I want you to look up Pythagoras. This is an activity that we that I often do with curriculum trauma. So just look up Pythagoras and and then hit um image. So everyone who's is on if you would do that. You you have the image? Okay. So what does he have in his hand? Is that a pen? A book. And the other hand? A a pyramid? A yes. pyramid. <laughs> yes. So good. So you, so what you want to begin to think about is this is this is you ready for this? This is gonna this is what curriculum trauma does. Um, Pythagoras neither approved proved it or extended the a squared plus b squared plus equals c squared theorem. In fact, before he even was born, the the Turkish use it. Um, the Indians used it, the Chinese used it, and they all have it written. It's not like it's not there. But of course, 2,500 years before he was born, the pyramids were built. You cannot build a pyramid without that theorem. It is really called the Cometan theorem. But what happened is when you have white supremacy or European supremacy, they're taking the knowledge. All of the Greeks went to the University of Alexandria, right, in Africa, to learn those things and brought it back. And then many put their names on things. But the reality is that Pythagoras neither proved it nor extended it. And we have to begin to think about that. We are going through these schools teaching children that this is Pythagoras' theorem when it is not. It is not his theorem. And you have to understand that that type of um, trauma is in, in, it's endemic in our curriculum. 
And it's a it's a part of this whole um the unintended consequences of Brown, right? Uh, many teachers were teaching that it was a commitment theorem, right? Um, the other part is the the idea of the lost cause, which was developed by the daughters of the Confederacy, right? This whole idea that the Confederates were heroes and and um, American heroes, when actually they were not neither American nor were they heroes, right? They they um, conceded from the United States, right? And so they weren't American heroes. They were not, they were no longer Americans. And so those realities are what curriculum trauma has done. And it is, it is what the unintended consequence of Brown did. Th to save the idea of white supremacy, the curriculum was attacked. Not only were blacks put out of schools, but the curriculum was then flooded with whitewashed reality. And so I would I would end with that, that we want to begin to think about how to, to rectify that. And one of the ways I believe to rectify it is to put more um, minoritized teachers in classrooms so that the salt can be flavored. And I'll end with that. Thank you so much, Dr. Hancock. And, you know, if you also want to start the process of learning fuller history and learning honest history, feel free to come out and visit the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum for a tour. We're there Tuesday through Saturday, nine to five. We give tours every hour uh, to anybody who is up for it. So thank you so much for joining us today. This has been really delightful. Thank you everybody for uh, logging on. Um, we really appreciate you and have a wonderful night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.